This will be the first of two lectures suggesting ways in which cumulative syntax can be employed to remind us of sentence moves that almost always improve our writing. This lecture will discuss the advantages of incorporating similes into cumulative sentences. Similes generally describe something in terms of something else, the comparison being signaled by like or as or the phrases as if or as though. The next lecture will focus on the advantages of using speculative phrases, usually beginning with words such as because or possibly or perhaps. But I'm going to throw you a wee bit of a curve in both of these lectures because technically most of the sentence moves I'll be describing are not exactly cumulative. However, it ought to be clear by now that I'm a much more interested, uh, that I'm much more interested in the way a sentence works, the way it does what it does, than in naming its parts or holding it to strict grammatical standards. Accordingly, both this lecture and the next one will be talking about steps a sentence can take that may not be cumulative in a strict grammatical sense, but that work cumulatively, plugging into cumulative rhythms and offering the same kind of overlap and repetitive emphasis we expect of cumulative modifying phrases. The bottom line here is that no matter what we call them, these sentence moves can make our writing more effective. Possibly more important, by adding steps to our sentences that give our readers a new way of looking at what we are writing about, we make our writing more distinctive, more clearly the product of a unique consciousness, our own, a reflection of our individuality, a sign of our originality. And whatever prose style is, that's one of its important functions. I'm sure we all remember the basic definition of a simile as one of two primary figures of speech, similes and metaphors, both of which make comparisons, asking us to think of something in terms that may at first seem surprising. A simile explicitly compares two things of different kind or quality, usually introducing the comparison with like or as. A metaphor is a kind of stealth simile, offering a comparison of two things of different kinds or quality, but implying or assuming the comparison and not introducing it explicitly with words such as like or as. Thus, she ran like a gazelle is a simile, comparing a girl to a famously fast and graceful animal and introducing the comparison with the word like. But she gazelled her way across the field would be a metaphor, the comparison implicit in a verb that suggests her movement had qualities that might be associated with a gazelle. Not every simile is a metaphor, since some similes simply make comparisons and do not ask us to think of one situation or thing as being something else. But every metaphor inherently implies the comparison we find in a simile. Both similes and metaphors make our writing more interesting and more effective. Both quickly and powerfully suggest comparisons that might be impossible to explain in any literal way. Years ago, S.I. Hayakawa noted in his classic textbook, Language in Thought and Action, that similes don't actually compared to apparently dissimilar things or situations as much as they compare our feelings toward those two things or situations, thus offering a window onto the way we feel as well as the way we think. As Hayakawa puts it, quote, the simile is something of a compromise stage between the direct, unreflective expression of feeling and the report but of course, closer to the former than the latter, end of quote. He goes on to suggest that, quote, the imaginative process by which phrases such as these similes are coined is the same as that by which poets arrive at poetry. 
In poetry, there is the same love of seeing things in scientifically outrageous but emotionally expressive language. End of quote. I mention Hayakawa's view not only because I think it gets directly at the way similes work in our writing, but also because, like Josephine Miles, he reminds us that prose and poetry are not so different in their appeals, both taking steps that have more in common than we might at first think, both offering effective platforms for the use of similes to strengthen the relationship between writers and their readers. For instance, he endured a firestorm of criticism, gets and holds our attention more effectively, at least I think, than he endured intense criticism. Although what he endured didn't actually involve either smoke or fire. But the metaphor, a firestorm of criticism, or the simile, the criticism he faced hit him like a firestorm, both have an emotional aspect that reveals something of the writer's sense of the intensity and drama of the situation in which someone is being criticized, not just the fact that someone is being criticized. Or when we say she ran like a gazelle, we probably don't literally mean that she was as fast as that particular animal, that she ran on all fours and so on, but we are expressing a kind of visceral admiration at the way she runs. Professional writers rely heavily on figurative language, similes and metaphors, to make their sentences at once more informative and more interesting. More informative by suggesting clarifying comparisons, more interesting by turning the sentence into a more vivid, engaging, or speculative direction. In the past, you may have encountered a writing teacher who warned you against relying heavily on similes and metaphors, apparently viewing these lively figures of speech as, quote, mere ornament, touches that might add superficial flair to our writing, but that make no important contribution. Indeed, E.B. White, in the list of reminders included in his An Approach to Style chapter, which he added to Professor Strunk's advice in their combined book, The Elements of Style, seems to belong to this particular school of thought, sounding a warning against heavy use of similes. We can almost hear him sniff when Mr. White dismissively writes, quote, The simile is a common device and a useful one, but similes coming in rapid fire, one right on top of another, are more distracting than illuminating. The reader needs time to catch his breath. He can't be expected to compare everything with something else with no relief in sight. End of quote. Now, I don't know what kind of writers Mr. White was thinking of when he wrote this warning, but the last thing I worry about with my writing students today is that they might use too many similes, overwhelming their readers with a cascade of comparisons. Indeed, I have to labor mightily to get my students to use any similes. I urge them to think of the simile as an important way to forge an emotional link with their readers, at once suggesting to readers that the writer is doing his or her level best to make clear what he or she is trying to describe or explain, and giving readers a glimpse into the way the writer thinks, as opposed to just what the writer sees or reports. Our choice of similes shows how we process information, how we think about the information we're passing along to our readers, how we organize it, how we understand it, our attitudes toward it. As Aristotle suggested in his rhetoric, the ability to make comparisons between things that are unlike and seemingly far apart is, quote, a sign of sound intuition in a philosopher, end of quote, one mark of a sharp and distinctive mind. I think that in most writing situations, it is not just advantageous, but is in fact crucial that writers reveal their distinctive individuality, their personality, 
as sound thinkers through their writing. Accordingly, I try to get my students to see the importance of processing information rather than just presenting it. A security camera in a convenience store can present what happens in front of its lens, but that security camera is just like every other security camera in every other convenience store. We might prefer to have the information that camera presents to not having the information, but we have no reason whatsoever to value what it records and presents over what any other or every other security camera would record and present. I see writing in much the same way. I think one of the most important goals of our writing is to reveal the nature of the writer's mind at work a process in which the writer wants readers to value the writer's thoroughness, accuracy, and logic, but also the writer's unique way of looking at and understanding the world. That's really what's at stake when we talk about a writer's style, and I try to get my students to see the importance of writing with style rather than writing as if they were an unthinking and unfeeling security camera. And cumulative syntax offers us great opportunities to do exactly that. The cumulative sentence gives us an effective way of organizing the information and opinion we present in our writing, suggesting to our readers that we do take pains to keep the logical relationships clear among the propositions our sentences advance, suggesting to our readers that we are attuned to the rhythmic pleasures of language as well as to its utilitarian functions, forging a kind of implicit contract with our readers in which they can be confident that we're doing our level best to communicate as fully and clearly with them as we possibly can. And more to the point of this lecture, cumulative syntax also gives us great opportunities to make even more distinctive similes a part of our writing practice. Indeed, in keeping with the way in which we can think of cumulative syntax as a generative syntax offering us prompts, inviting us to use similes to sum up or look back on previous information or details from a new vantage point. More important, when writers add a simile to their cumulative sentence, they give the sentence a distinctive touch, making a comparison that may be surprising revealing something important, individualistic, and possibly unique about the way the writer's mind works. Listen to the striking opening sentence of Joseph Conrad's The Secret Sharer. On my right hand, there were lines of fishing stakes resembling a mysterious system of half-submerged bamboo fences, incomprehensible in its division of the domain of tropical fishes and crazy of aspect, as if abandoned forever by some nomad tribe of fishermen now gone to the other end of the ocean, for there was no sign of human habitation as far as the eye could reach. I've slightly repunctuated this sentence to emphasize its cumulative rhythms, but I cite it here to note how it is only when we get to the simile as if abandoned forever by some nomad tribe of fishermen that we fully understand the extent to which Conrad's narrator has a very active imagination and loves to use it to make stories out of what he sees. In other words, while mastery of coordinates, subordinate, and mixed cumulative forms is an important goal and may tell us a lot about a writer's syntactic skill and versatility, it doesn't do much to distinguish the skill and versatility of one writer who writes great cumulative sentences from the skill and versatility of another writer who also can write great cumulative sentences. However, the similes these two writers will think of, the comparisons they will make, will almost certainly be different, each writer drawing from different knowledge, different experiences, and revealing different interests. In this way, 
The similes these writers choose may tell us much more about the way each thinks and sees the world than does the sentence structure each favors. Whatever we understand a writer's style to be, one key to the nature of that style is likely to be found in the writer's use of figurative language. This is an important part of what Walker Gibson is getting at when he writes in his classic study of style, Tough, Sweet, and Stuffy, that, quote, a style is not simply a response to a particular kind of subject matter, nor is it entirely a matter of the writer's situation and his presumed audience. It is partly a matter of sheer individual will, a desire for a particular kind of self-definition, no matter what the circumstances." End of quote. Our use of figurative language is one of the acts of self-definition that goes into creating the style of our writing. And while our use of the cumulative syntax is itself an act of self-definition that goes toward establishing the style of our writing, that cumulative syntax also lends itself to our using both similes and metaphors in our writing. Indeed, the distinctive cumulative rhythm particularly invites and rewards our use of similes. Consider the following sentences, some seen and heard before, but now see them taking a new step with the addition of a simile. The boy sat down at the table, eagerly anticipating the feast, never suspecting it would be the last meal he would eat, acting as carefree as a lark. Okay, I'm not at all sure that larks are really carefree, and I am sure that carefree as a lark is a much overused cliché. But this simile adds a sense of closure to the sentence, a final comment that sums up all that has gone before it. Imagine how much more effective a more original simile would work here, possibly something along the lines of as unconcerned with his future as a pig in mud, or better make that as a shark in a feeding frenzy. Well, you get the idea. Try this one. Tired and hungry, just back from a week in the bush, I limped into the mess hall, hoping the food lines were still open, feeling like the fool it seemed I had become. Or this one. The chef prepared the fish carefully, stuffing it with wild rice, sautéing it briefly, its sweet aroma blending smoothly with the other enticing odors in the kitchen, the fish becoming more than a food item, ascending to the status of art as if transformed by magic. Or this. The boy fainted, a goofy-looking sixth grader, his face turning white, muscles turning to jelly, dropping his books, uttering a kind of pained squeak, scared witless by what he saw, seeming to shrivel up like a deflating balloon. Now, as it happens, I'm not proud of or even satisfied with any of the above sentences. The similes I've added in final modifying phrases aren't very original, they aren't very striking, and they aren't very effective. In great part, that is the case because they were arbitrarily tacked on to the end of already completed sentences, rather than growing out of the logic of the sentence as it developed. I offer these examples only as a rather crude reminder that the cumulative syntax provides an armature on which we can almost always tack a simile. In much the same way that any sentence can be turned into a cumulative sentence if we only change the period at its end to a comma and start adding free modifying phrases, any cumulative sentence can be summed up or clinched by adding one more modifying phrase that contains a comparison introduced by like or as, as if, or as though. And of course, the simile doesn't have to come at the end of the sentence, but can be introduced before or after or in the middle of the base clause, as is true of free modifying phrases in general. Here's the way Thomas Pynchon 
incorporates similes into some of his characteristically cumulative sentences in his recent novel, Against the Day. They loomed out there in black mystery above the bright interiors and the pharaoh players and insatiably desirable girls and sometimes shadowy figures could be seen kneeling, reaching out to touch one of these slag piles reverently, as if like some counter-Christian Eucharist, it represented the body of an otherworldly beloved. Here's another. With the sun at this angle, the Karatag looked like a stone city broken into gray crystalline repetitions of city blocks and buildings windowless as if inhabited by that which was past sight, past light, past all need for distinguishing outside from in. Kit found he could not look at this country directly for more than a minute or so, as if its ruling spirits might properly demand obliquity of gaze as a condition of passage. Or, she would return to her deck chair out of breath, sweating, exhilarated for no reason, as if she had just escaped some organized threat to her safety. After running madly round and round in the same tight circle at top speed a number of times, the vessel, as if getting a grip on itself, finally slowed down, easing back to vertical and steadying on to a new course, southeast by east. These sentences are noteworthy in a number of different ways. First of all, I hope you hear their insistent cumulative rhythms, even if they're not always punctuated in ways that emphasize their essentially cumulative structure. Second, I'm pretty sure you can't miss their essential ambiguity. None of these sentences out of context makes it clear what's going on but all suggest a kind of mysterious, numinous quality to the semblance of Pynchon's novel. Each as if suggests the possibility that something is going on other than what seems to be the case, that a report of what characters can see or seem to understand may not be enough to capture the indeterminacy of Pynchon's world. And finally, while the similes he uses may not be dramatic showstoppers, so striking they will stick in our minds long after we've closed the pages, the pages of Pynchon's novel, they are arguably not comparisons any of us would have thought of, thus serving to reinforce, as if it really needed reinforcing, the uniqueness of Thomas Pynchon's novelistic vision. Indeed, consider for just a moment some of the other numerous similes Pynchon uses. And here, both to save time and to focus more intensely, I'll just reproduce the similes stripped from the sentences in which they appear. As if the division between the singers were more than the width of a valley, as if they were protecting themselves against future gringo mischief, as if in the breeze from an undefined wing passing his face, as if emerging from the resolute blankness of history, as if this were a message from a realm with which he had done business, as if parties to a secret whose terrible face was somehow conveniently set to one side, as if it were not a fellow's appearance so much as his odor she wished to appear indifferent to as if there were something up here to be gotten through as a point of honor. Pensions against the day teems with similes such as these, just as it teems with elaborately extended cumulative sentences. Indeed, I think it's safe to say that against the day contains more similes and more cumulative sentences than has any American novel written in the past 50 years. Of course, when we remember that Against the Day is a whopping 1,085 pages long, it probably has a formidable head start in both categories, with competition possible from only a few other massive novels, such as David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest or Neal Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. 
My point is not to plug Pynchon's novel, although I think it quite remarkable and rewarding, both for students of American fiction and for students of the sentence, but to note how his characteristic similes fit so well into his characteristically cumulative sentences. Pynchon frequently places his similes at the last, as the last of a number of sentence steps, using that final as if as a kind of summary comment on what has come before. But he also uses the simile as a kind of hinge earlier in the sentence, a step which turns the sentence in a new direction with subsequent cumulative modifying phrases pointing back to elaborating and or explaining the simile itself. And of course, Pynchon is far from being alone in employing similes in this fashion and to this effect. For instance, we can see something similar going on in Joyce Carol Oates's frequently anthologized creepy short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? There, Oates introduces the very threatening Arnold Friend, who may be a serial killer, may be the devil, or just an old fiend, as rearranging the letters of his name suggests. And she creates the mood of her story in part by using simile-clinched sentences such as these. They went up through the maze of parked and cruising cars to the bright-lit, fly-infested restaurant, their faces pleased and expectant as if they were entering a sacred building that loomed out of the night to give them what haven and what blessing they yearned for. He was standing in a strange way, leaning back against the car as if he were balancing himself. He stood there so stiffly relaxed, pretending to be relaxed, with one hand idly on the door handle, as if he were keeping himself up that way and had no intention of ever moving again. She watched this smile come, awkward, as if he were smiling from inside a mask. Once again, I want to call attention to the way in which these similes lend themselves to cumulative rhythm, giving the sentence another distinctive step, even when that step is not emphasized by punctuation. So far, most of the examples of similes I've offered have introduced their explicit comparisons with the words as if, even though we know that similes are frequently, if not most frequently, identified by the use of like to indicate a comparison. He spoke like a robot. She looked like a troublemaker. They huddled together like sheep. Nor have I given many examples in which the comparison is introduced by as though which grammatical expert after grammatical expert assures us, incorrectly I believe, means exactly the same thing as does as if. More on this distinction in a moment. I've focused on as if similes because they most powerfully lend themselves to cumulative rhythm. Similes introduced by like need to be processed a bit before they fit as well into cumulative sentences. He spoke like a robot shows no sign of cumulative syntax, but with the addition of just a bit more information, always a good thing in my view, the simile can become a cumulative step. He spoke slowly, mechanically, without inflection, like a robot. We even start to plug into the strength of cumulative syntax in a much shorter version of this sentence that would read, he spoke slowly like a robot, or better still, he spoke slowly, sounding like a robot. The point I want to make here is that similes, while not always technically cumulative modifying phrases, can work exactly like a cumulative, uh, cumulative modifying phrase works. If the sentence clearly takes a step, indicated either by punctuation, usually a comma or a dash, or by the distinctive rhythm of cumulative progression, then I'm happy to call the simile a cumulative step, and I'm happier still when I come across these steps in the writing of my students. 
Bottom line is that our writing benefits when we use similes and metaphors to reveal more about the way we think or feel about what we're writing. And I think our writing benefits even more when we incorporate the similes we use into cumulative syntax. I should stress that I don't value similes more than I value metaphors. Just the case that my metaphors, that the metaphors come in so many varieties, I can't generalize about how they might be used in conjunction with the characteristic advantages offered the writer who controls cumulative syntax. And here, once again, we see how the cumulative syntax can function generatively, acting as a heuristic prompt to urge us to make our sentences more detailed, better explained, more individualistic, more effective. I do not believe that mechanical by the numbers sentence construction is the key to producing more effective sentences, but I do believe that the writer who understands a full range of syntactic and rhetorical options is much more likely to take advantage of opportunities where those options might apply than is the writer who does not command the full range of tools provided by a thorough knowledge of cumulative syntax.